What is it that changes one from being a person who listens to one who acts? My own life has been too full of sins of omission, but this much I know. One cannot be hurt as we were hurt that morning and then stand idle. We cannot continue to shield ourselves from knowledge of wrongdoing. We must be involved. Dorothy James was born in 1900, the daughter of James Garrett Biddle and Mary Hutton, and the direct descendant of Quakers William Biddle and Sarah Kemp, who immigrated to the United States in 1681. The story of Dorothy James and her fight for the freedom of all people began a century before her birth in the person of Thomas Garrett, her great-great-grandfather and a Delaware County native who, after moving to Wilmington, Delaware, made his home the last station on the Underground Railroad. Over a 40-year period, Thomas Garrett was credited with helping more than 2,700 slaves escape to freedom. Born and raised in Upper Darby, Garrett's parents actively hid runaway slaves in their farmhouse, and he was raised with the teachings of tolerance espoused by the church. As a young man, an employee of the family was kidnapped and nearly forced into slavery. Garrett chased after the offender and freed the friend. From his awakening at that time, Garrett devoted his life to the quest for human equality and dignity. In 1848, Garrett, brought before the federal court, admitted to aiding fugitive slaves and would continue to do so, he said. The heavy fine imposed on him forced him into bankruptcy, but his anti-slavery friends helped him to re-establish his business in the iron trade. After his trial, he said to the court, Thou hast left me without a dollar. I say to thee and to all those in this courtroom, that if anyone knows of a fugitive who wants shelter, send him to Thomas Garrett, and he will befriend him. After passage of the 15th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which provided that neither the federal government nor any state could abridge the right of any citizen to vote on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, former slaves paraded Garrett through the streets of Wilmington in an open carriage inscribed with the words, Our Moses. Garrett died in 1871 and left instructions that he be carried to his grave by African Americans and that they should participate in the Quaker service. In the mid-19th century, Delaware was a slave state. Even though it was the only southern state where a black was considered free, unless he or she was proven to be a slave. For most fugitive slaves, crossing into Delaware County was the first time in generations that members of their families experienced life without slavery. Delaware County historian Nancy Webster believes that Harriet Tubman, the most well-known Underground Railroad conductor, worked with Thomas Garrett to make numerous trips up Route 13 through the state of Delaware into Delaware County. She surmises that Tubman probably traveled through Concord Township, through Chester Heights, and went to Middletown Township where a large free black community thrived. Many Quaker families in Delaware County would sequester traveling slaves within their homes as they journeyed northward. Stations included Todd Morton in Wallingford, homes on Franklin Street in Media, and the Beards Farm on Stony Bank Road in Chester Heights. It still retains the external doors which led to the basement hiding places, as well as the stairways that led to the family living quarters. Dorothy Biddle was born into a family of privilege nearly 30 years after Garrett's death. The family lived outside of Philadelphia in Wallingford, Pennsylvania. Dorothy was educated at Media Friends and the West Town Schools. She received her registered nursing degree from Columbia University in 1918. Dorothy was not only a practicing Quaker, but had inherited her great-grandfather's spirit of justice. Throughout her life, Dorothy remained active at Media Friends School. In the 1930s, she served as chair of the 50-year-old school's social committee. It was during her tenure as chairman that Dorothy faced a situation that tested her beliefs and proved to be a testament to her moral character. In January 1937, Dorothy James received a call from Mrs. McKnight, the wife of a media physician, 
inquiring about enrolling her son in the Media Friends School. It was only after responding positively to the inquiry that Dorothy James became aware that the McKnights were Negroes. The conversation concluded with Dorothy James saying that the matter would be taken up promptly by the school committee. Not one to let things rest, Mrs. James visited the family at their home later the same evening and was favorably impressed. The conversation concluded with Mrs. McKnight saying, I am not the least bit interested in making an issue of this, nor do I want to embarrass anyone. All I want is the best for my child, just as you have for yours. Dorothy James brought the matter up before the school committee. Members of the committee voted to admit Lances McKnight to the school. The vote was strongly supported by each and every member of the school faculty and staff. On Monday, February 15th, Lances McKnight came to media friends and was accepted into the school. By Thursday, a storm of protest swelled from parents and a prepared statement was issued stating, we have just learned that the school has admitted as a pupil a child who is Negro. We regret that this change of policy was made without sufficient consultation with the parents of the children already enrolled as pupils in the school, particularly since it occurred in the middle of the year. We appreciate fully that you have the right to admit as a pupil any child whom you desire and that it is impossible for us to prevent you from doing so. On the other hand, if after the end of the current school year you continue to have as a pupil a child who is Negro, we fear that it will be inadvisable for us to continue to send our children to the school. No one of us has the slightest prejudice against the Negro race. But on the other hand, we believe it unwise and unnecessary to have our children thrown in close, daily association with Negro children. Once the door is opened, it is inevitable that others will follow. A struggle between the parents and the committee ensued, and for many months no one knew if the school could survive the loss of so many pupils. Dorothy James and others understood that the school could not afford to back away from a tenet that was a defining principle of their Quaker heritage. We have always thought of the school as a means to an end, rather than an end in itself. A very real part of this end to us is the developing of attitudes that will help children face life in terms of ultimate values. Among these values, we consider the recognition of persons on the basis of worth, regardless of race and creed, to be most important. We believe that any earnest group of parents should be alert to these trends of thought and should be interested in venturing along the course that leads away from the tendency and attitudes which result in fear and hatred, in economic injustice, in war, and in class, and race strife. The next term, though many students did not return, new faces appeared, such as that of Joan Adams, later to become the wife of Vice President Walter Mondale, whose family enrolled her at Media Friends in support of the school's decision. The school did survive and to this day remains a beacon of social justice. Mother was a nurse and a caregiver and even as a young woman took on responsibilities well beyond her years. Her support for Lancis's admittance in the Media Friends School motivated Joan Mondale's parents to switch her from public school and place her in the Media Friends following the protests of many parents. Mrs. Mondale and mother maintained a bond of friendship and respect. Joan even included mother in the inaugural festivities when her husband Walter became vice president. The Media Friends protest was an awakening for Dorothy James, much as the kidnapping of the family servant was for Thomas Garrett. She became conscious of injustice, and six years later she played an instrumental role in an incident that led to the formation of the Media Interracial Fellowship, later to become the Media Fellowship House. On Monday, October 11th, Julia Fowler and I happened to be lunching at the Tower Restaurant at the corner of State and Olive Streets in Media. 
We had not been there long when two attractive, well-dressed colored women came in. One of them was carrying a small baby in her arms. They sat at a table near us, and we were delighted with what we assumed to be a liberal policy on the part of the comparatively new restaurant. Before long, it was evident that they were receiving no attention. In fact, were being purposely neglected. After hoping as long as we could that at least one waitress would respond to their obvious desire for attention, I went to the woman who appeared to be in charge only to find out that the neglect was deliberate. She insisted that it was nothing to the management who ate there, but that the waitresses would not serve to Negroes. If they should begin doing so, they would be flooded with them. Other patrons walked out when Negroes came in, etc., etc. I agreed with her that doubtless a few people would leave, but said that I felt sure there were a good many others who would make it a point to patronize their restaurant if they knew the tower observed the liberal policy. While I was in the midst of this conversation, one of the ladies came up to inquire why they had received no service. The answer was simple. Our waitresses will not serve you. The conversation that followed was tragic and futile, so far as immediate results were concerned. The women, hurt and humiliated, left the restaurant. Dorothy James and her friend caught up with Marie Whitaker and her sister and joined them for lunch at the Media Drugstore, a place owned by a Jewish pharmacist with liberal views. My parents were predisposed to social activism. The 1943 encounter at the restaurant, although troubling for my mother, was fortuitous and eventually provided my parents an opportunity to work with Dorothy James and with others on the matters in which they believed. My father, coming from the South, had many reasons to distrust white people. He recognized, though, Dorothy James's grace and integrity, and our families remained close throughout their lives. A uh, fellowship house included people like the Jameses and Ethel Mason and many families with many children and lots of gatherings. My memories start with the uh, building at 302 South Jackson Street, but uh, I know that the leadership there was steady and hardworking because they were able to move from a rented or donated small space to the current house with a staff and regular programming. Fellowship House spun off the Fair Housing Council and with youth programs continues to be a center for fostering respect and understanding among people with external differences. John James remembers that his mother's activism was still very much alive in her middle years. In the early 1950s, I learned of mother's participation along with other members of the media Fellowship House in a demonstration that, of support of an African-American couple that moved into a house in a previously all-white Havertown neighborhood. Initially, it was not detected by the white neighbors that it was a Negro couple. Dr. Hare passed, that is, it was thought that he was white and that his wife, who was more of obviously African-American, was the live-in maid. When it became evident that they were man and wife, they were subjected to a very strong protest from their new neighbors. The protest led to the group, which included my mother, going to the Hare's house in demonstration of support. As our mother walked back to her car, she was verbally accosted by one of the neighbors. One or two days later, mother drove back to the neighborhood and went to the house of the woman who had vilified her, presented herself as the person to whom the woman had yelled her protest. The two of them went to the kitchen and talked. That's what mother did, quietly and courageously and with dignity. She didn't try to convince the woman that she was wrong. She just invoked her own opinion as to what she thought was right. Though not much is written of Dorothy James in her later years, she continued to support the Media Fellowship House and its causes and endeavors. In 1979, she was honored by the Media Fellowship House, along with Ethel Mason, at the organization's 35th anniversary celebration. When interviewed by E.B. Graham for a local newspaper prior to the event, she recalled Victor Hugo's words, Greater than the tread of mighty armies is an idea whose time has come. She continued by saying that she still looked at her work as unfinished. Dorothy James passed away in 1985, having earned the love and respect of the community in which she lived throughout her lifetime, and a legacy that remains today 
and will continue to carry influence for many generations. Media Fellowship House was founded on the principles that Dorothy James held dear. That all men and women have the right to be treated with the same degree of respect and dignity. Our mission, after more than 60 years, remains the same. To bring people of all ethnic, religious, and cultural groups together in a spirit of harmony. Though Dorothy James was raised in a family of privilege, she understood that strength is gained from diversity, as well as adversity. She practiced what she believed, and in doing so, inspired others to open their hearts and minds. Her ideals are still with us at Media Fellowship House. They serve as beacons which guide us to understanding the ever-changing world and the diverse populations that inhabit it. Times have changed, needs have changed, solutions have changed, but the job is far from done. As I see it, this is not an age of pioneering, but a time to nurture in our own homes, schools, churches and communities, the seeds which have been sown in the clearings. We must choose to use the equipment God has given us in such a way that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts will be accepted in His sight. Thank you.